In this video, we are going to be going over the topics of chapter four, which have to do with the three-dimensional, in other words, the 3D structure of proteins. When it comes to protein structure, understand that there are four levels. And in this chapter, we are going to be talking about the important interactions that are present for each of them. So the four structural protein levels are primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. Now I'm going to proceed to explain what are the features specifically for the primary structure of a protein. When it comes to the primary structure of a protein, understand that the primary structure is specifically the sequence of amino acids that is present in a protein. Now, all proteins are built from the same 20 amino acids. The difference between the different proteins that exist in any organism comes from the idea that these protein sequences or these amino acid sequences, I should say, are going to be ordered differently in these sequences. These sequence of amino acids are what determines the 3D structure of a protein because as we're going to see as we progress discussing the different structural levels, the interactions that are created are going to basically estimate what is the overall structure for a given protein. Now, understand that because it's just the sequence of amino acids, the main thing that is part of the protein structure, then here the the main attractive force that is present in it is the peptide bonds. So those covalent bonds that are present holding these amino acids together is going to be the main force present in the primary structure. Now, understand that changes in the amino acid sequence can alter a protein's structure and function. Let's look at a specific example. Now, Understand that there is a condition out there that it is inherited that is called sickle cell anemia. It is a red blood cell disorder. When we look at the images that we have on the right side of the slide, we can see what is the shape of a healthy blood cell and what is the shape of a sickle cell blood cell. Now, these differences in how the cells look like actually comes from uh, the differences in the structure of a particular protein that is present in red blood cells, and that is hemoglobin. Understand that <clears throat> hemoglobin in a cell is the protein that is in charge of storing oxygen and even carrying oxygen inside the cell. So understand that <clears throat> when it comes to a sickle cell, the difference is that there is a amino acid residue that in the regular hemoglobin, it is a glutamic acid. In the sickle cell, we have that glutamic acid site change for a valine. So understand that this change from an acidic amino acid to a nonpolar amino acid now causes the hemoglobin molecule to clump. And that's what results in the formation of that sickle cell blood cell. So understand that sometimes changes in the amino acid sequence can result in dysfunction, also in changes in structure. But understand that sometimes these changes in amino acid sequence can actually result in the creation of new technologies that can be utilized in science. That's why I would now like to introduce to you guys changes in primary structure that actually gave rise to a very useful tool in molecular biology. So one of the things that have, was discovered many years ago and actually was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was the existence of proteins that are in jellyfish, specifically Aquora Victoria, that when you extract them and you are able to express them, they actually glow. So from the idea that these proteins cause jellyfish to glow and that we can extract it from there and use them, people started thinking, can we create more colors 
beyond the green because originally the first one that was discovered was GFP, which is the green fluorescent protein. So all I'm trying to illustrate here is that through molecular biology and through changes in the amino acid sequences of that original green fluorescent protein, that gave rise to a variety of colors derived from the green. They include the blue fluorescent protein, cerulean or ECFP, and that's because it's a different shade of blue. We have also the yellow fluorescent protein. Now, why is this important? Because at the time when this technology was developed, understand that when these proteins were placed specifically through other methods inside of the cell, we were able to visualize how a cell looks like. And as you can see in the bottom right corner of the slide, we have an image of some of these selected proteins that I introduced to you that are variants of GFP utilized to specifically um, separate the nucleus from the cytosol and even some filament components of inside the cell. Let's now discuss secondary structure. When it comes to the secondary structure of a protein, understand that there are two major classes of folds that can happen. The first one is an alpha helix. And as you can see on the right side of the slide, this looks like a winding staircase. Alpha helices are right-handed helices. So that means that that is the type of turn that they have. Now, this one specifically comes from a hydrogen bonding event that is going to happen every four amino acids. So if I zoom in to the image that we have and I just focus in one of these hydrogen bonding events, let's say that I highlight this one in green. What this means is that the carbonyl, the C double bond L in amino acid one, okay, the oxygen atom is going to act as a hydrogen bond acceptor. And then in amino acid four, understand that that is going to act as an H bond donor. In that interaction between the amino acids is what creates this helices. Now, there's other parameters that are also important for alpha helices. Understand that these hydrogen bondings are going to be parallel to the helix. As you can see, these interactions are going to happen, you know, specifically 3.6 residues per turn. That's why we just round it and say four, because we cannot think about having 60% of an amino acid. So that's why we just generalize and say, hey, amino acid one is going to hydrogen bond with amino acid four, specifically amino acid one, meaning I'm just counting. It doesn't say like the very first amino acid. This is just a, a general count that the amino acid that we label is going to interact through the oxygen and its carbonyl is going to hydrogen bond to the amide bond specifically on amino acid four. Now, understand that in alpha helices, the side chains actually stick out of the helix. And we also have from experimental data regions that are known that if you have amino acids like histidine, glutamic acid, leucine, methionine, alanine, asparagine, so on and so forth, if you have an area that is rich in these amino acids, they tend to fold as alpha helices. In addition to alpha helices, we also have a different type of fold that is called a beta pleated sheet. A beta pleated sheet is going to be like, in a way you can imagine like those pleated skirts that have been utilized in fashion. Now, understand that in beta pleated sheets, the side chains, the R groups, are going to alternate sticking out above and below the plane. Now, the actual 
type of bonding that has to occur that gives rise to a beta pleated sheet is going to be similar to the one in alpha helix. From the point of view that we're going to have the carbonyl of an amino acid, specifically at the oxygen, hydrogen bond to the NH, okay? But this is a little bit different because it's going to happen between strands. Understand that for beta pleated sheets, the hydrogen bonding are going to be perpendicular to the direction of the sheet. And similar to what I explained before, if you have an area of a specific sequence of amino acid, it has been observed experimentally that it tends to fold like a beta pleated sheet. The amino acid regions or the propensity to make a beta um, pleated sheet includes um, amino acids that are glycine, alanine, valine, isoleucine, serine, threonine, so on and so forth. Now, when it comes to beta pleated sheets, understand that they actually have two ways in which they can be wrapped. One is parallel, and as you can see, the way that the strand is um, in a way wrapped is parallel because we have the amino to the carboxy region of the two strands in the same direction. And in an anti-parallel direction for a beta pleated sheet, we see that the amino in the carboxy terminus of the two strands are going to be in opposite directions. That's just how it is folding. Now, understand that when it comes to the secondary structure, alpha helices and beta pleated sheets are going to be it. There are areas of the protein that do not adopt any of these two folds, and those are going to be unstructured regions. When it comes to the tertiary structure of a protein, understand that the tertiary uh, structure of a protein basically has to do with interactions of the side chains of the amino acids in the protein. And understand that these interactions of the side chains can be non-covalent or they can be covalent. When it comes to the non-covalent structures, or the, sorry, non-covalent interactions, they include hydrogen bonding between the side chains of the amino acids. And when it comes to, as you can see, side chains hydrogen bonding, we can see here that you can envision that one side chain has an OH group, like in serine, threonine, tyrosine. And then the other side chain that is going to be interacting with can be a carboxylate, like aspartic acid or glutamic acid. Make sure that you review which side chains of amino acids can actually involve themselves in hydrogen bonding events. We can also have electrostatic attractions between the side chains of opposite charge. So when this happens, understand that we must have one set of amino acids that is going to be one charge, meaning a cation, and then the other one, an anion. So if we focus on this interaction, and here specifically we have an amino group, you can envision out of the basic amino acids that lysine, arginine can be that amino acid that is positively charged. And similar to what we've seen before, those carboxylates that are going to be um, specifically uh, aspartic acid, glutamic acid can do this electrostatic attraction. Understand that specifically when these occur, they're also called a salt bridge. 
And this comes from the idea that similar to salts in ionic compounds, we have a full cation and a full anion. Another type of interaction can be hydrophobic forces. And a fiber hydrophobic um, interaction is going to be those amino acids that are not going to like water. So in general, the amino acids that have hydrophobic forces or hydrophobic interactions on their stand are going to be your non-polar amino acids. That's why when we look at the example that we have on this slide, we have leucine, valine, isoleucine. Understand that we can also have metal ion coordination. And this metal ion coordination Pretty much what happens is that we're going to have a metal ion and the ones that I typically have observed is magnesium or zinc. And when it comes to their interaction, it's going to happen with things that are largely negative. So you can envision uh, carboxylates like aspartic acid and glutamic acid actually holding that metal uh, cation in the following manner. That's not the only example. This is just one that comes to mind. That if you have a carboxylate from the amino acid, they can interact with the metal ion. This is just to illustrate an example. One that it is not in the image, but I'm going to include is if you have an amino acid, for example, serine, threonine, tyrosine, that actually interacts with water. So in addition to the ones that are there, you can envision, and I'm just going to do the dotted lines. Let me highlight them. To illustrate that we can also have hydrophilic interactions. And as you can imagine, if it's something is hydrophilic, then is technically in love with water, so it's going to interact with water via hydrogen bonding, but it can also do it through dipole-dipole attraction. When it comes to tertiary structure, there is one of the interactions that is actually a covalent interaction. And that is specifically a disulfide bond. Understand that a disulfide bond is going to happen specifically between cysteine residues. Those are the only amino acids that when they get oxidized, they can form this disulfide bond. So another observation is that in this hydrophilic, hydrophobic interaction that happens in protein, I just want to specify that you can imagine that if the red circles represent a hydrophobic region and the blue circles represent a hydrophilic region, one of the observations that it can also be appreciated in the previous figure is that we tend to see the hydrophobic region inside of the protein. And since a hydrophilic region can interact with the water, we tend to see them outside of a particular protein. Now, lastly, we have the quaternary structure for a protein. Now, the quaternary structure of a protein is not present in every protein. Most proteins have a primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. Only proteins that have multiple subunits will have a quaternary structure. Because in terms of looking at the overall structure of a protein, the units have to come together to give rise to the structure of the protein. So, these chains that have to come together are these subunits. So what I mean with chains is just the polypeptide chains. Um, so these components, 
these subunits, these chains, are going to interact with one another via electrostatic interactions, hydrogen bonding, and hydrophobic interactions. Understand that it is a combination of these that allows them to uh, come together. To give you an example of a protein that has a quaternary structure, in the image that we have on the left side of the slide, we have the overall structure of hemoglobin. Notice that here we have some ribbon-like structures. Those are going to be the alpha helices. But the most important thing that you should note is that hemoglobin is going to have two orange areas, two fuchsia areas, and this is just a color scheme that was adopted by the person that did the structure. But altogether, hemoglobin has four subunits that has to come together. 